Hey, Skyler. What an honor to be your friend and colleague and to have a few moments to look back at your career and to look forward. I hope you will say a few words about the future at the end of our little conversation. But could you take a, a little time to talk about the beginning of your scientific career? I remember a story about geese following you. Maybe this was the first scientific study you did. Well, it's interesting. You remember it was actually ducks and not oh, geese. Ducks, I, okay. But it's all you know. They're similar. Uh, uh, you know, they're both uh, uh, you know similar kinds of birds. But uh, I took a, a course in college uh, in uh, animal behavior, and uh, it was although I took it as a psychology course, it was based in the poultry science department, and. Uh, one of the animals that we dealt with were ducks and uh, we hatched them and tried to show that, you know, if you hatched a duck and you were there and said, hi, I'm your mama or acted like you were, they'd follow you around and they went anywhere. And, uh, you know, the experiment worked. We did that. We did that in class and I had my two little ducks um, and I said, gee, you know, at the end of the class, I didn't want to sacrifice these ducks. So I took them home. And they continued to follow me about, and they'd go everywhere I'd go. And, uh, you know, I learned that I even took them to the supermarket and they'd walk down the aisle behind me. Uh, but, um, but one of the things I learned was that if you take the duck's nose and you push it to the ground and you take your finger and you move it out straight from it, it focuses on that and it becomes frozen in that position. So it's a way of hypnotizing the ducks by just drawing the little line. And I found that to be a, a fascinating uh, thing. And I just want, I've always wondered whether that applies to, 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 to all levels of animals and not just birds, but it certainly works with birds. Yeah, wouldn't it be great if you could do that with humans? <laughs> I had this strange idea I could hypnotize myself into remembering everything I, <laughs> I'd ever read. And uh, that didn't work, but... Uh, well, you started your career as a biologist and you started to differentiate uh, towards becoming a diabetologist, among other things. Well, so, not amongst other things. That's all I became uh, in, in the end. I, I was a, um, uh, the beginning of the third year of, of medical school, I took an elective in research in diabetes. And uh, my, my mentor was Dick Field. Uh, he had come to Jefferson where I went to medical school from, from Harvard because we had a, a neurosurgeon at Jefferson, uh, Nicholas Zervis. And uh, Dr. Zervis had developed the technique of transphenoidal hypophysectomy. And uh, what Dick Field had been doing in Boston before he came to uh, uh, to Philadelphia, was working with, uh, with the local neurosurgeons and ophthalmologists in Boston, and they were doing open craniotomies to do hypophysectomies to stop aggressive diabetic retinopathy as a desperation procedure. Wow. Um, and he thought that the procedure Zervis had would be a whole lot better, and therefore he moved to continue the work and to uh, collect, hang on one second here. Okay, put that phone away so it doesn't annoy us. Um, but he came come to Philadelphia to work with Nick Zervis so that they could, instead of doing open craniotomies, do the transphenoidal procedure, which was um, um, really much less invasive. And my assignment was to grade the retinal photographs. And I was put in this room where there were all sorts of photographs on the wall. There, this was before the Wisconsin Reading Center had ever been developed. This is 1967. So on the wall, there were all these pictures of retina, you know, grade A, B, C, D, E. And my job was to take the retinal photographs from the patients. I didn't know whether they were before or after, they just had a, a number when they were given to me and compare them to the ones on the wall and, and give them a grade. 
and uh, you know working in a in a room projecting slides on the wall and looking at comparable pictures and comparisons of them could get really pretty boring after a little bit and so I asked to go on rounds with Dr. Zervis and Dr. Field to see the patients and lo and behold here I am a young medical student and what I discover is that the patients were for the most part my own age wow and already going seriously blind from diabetic retinopathy. And when you talk to them, they had a history of, you know, we, they measured urine glucose in those days of having huge amounts of glycosuria. And there was no real way to control their diabetes very well. They were taking insulin. Most of them were taking one shot a day of NPH or Lente, even with type one diabetes and no way to really monitor that. And I, I shook my head in horror and went and looked at the literature and the literature suggested that, you know, you could actually uh, not have complications in some of the animal models if you really had, you know, able to control the glucose. But, um, you know, that was controversial in, in human beings. Uh, around that same time was when uh, Marvin Sipperstein and Joe Williamson were having their arguments as to whether glucose control mattered or whether, it was the complications were a separate genetic phenomenon, uh, independent of glucose control. And Marvin Sipperstein, who was wrong with the data and was eventually eventually yielded on that, um, always won the debates because he was a very articulate speaker. And Joe Williamson was sort of a mumbly, humbly little guy who, you know, had the right data, but couldn't make the, the points. You know, I, I learned something else from that, uh, watching the debate, is that when there's controversies in the field, don't have it be debated in a major medical meeting because the audience will go away confused and not change their behavior one bit. And I think that's a very important lesson as we've evolved in, in diabetes. So, but but from, from that time as a, as a beginning of my junior year of medical school, um, I differentiated to a, to a diabetes specialist and focused on that throughout the rest of my career. Even in medical school, if I took a nephrology elective, um, I would pay attention to diabetic kidney disease. When I took surgery, I tried to figure out how the best way to drip insulin infusions were. Everything I did focused on, on diabetes from then on out and uh, continued to, uh, to, to work with it. And when I moved to Duke as, a, as an intern, uh, spent a few months on the ward, and then I was assigned for my month in the, a month in the clinic. And the... Uh, the uh, uh, faculty member who ran the clinic was a, um, a distinguished uh, clinician, Morton Bogdanoff, and he wanted everybody to present something they knew about as a preclinic conference. And so I presented pictures of diabetic retinopathy and how they improved with hypophysectomy. And he said to me, Dr. Bogdanoff did, you ever talk to Dr. Kempner about this? And I said, who? He said, Walter Kempner, he runs the rice diet. I said, what's that? He says, you're going to have to read about it. I'm going to give you some papers. And he gave me some papers. And he said, I, he, one of the papers was that with the rice diet, diabetic retinopathy improved. And I said, wait a minute. Um, I, want to, I want to meet this guy. He goes, well, he won't meet with you, but I'll call him and grease the wheel so he will meet with you. And so Dr. Bogdanoff set up a meeting with me and Dr. Kempner. And uh, with Dr. Kempner and I, is that better English? But, uh, and, uh, and I met with him and said, what is this? And he, he said, this is a bloodless hypophysectomy. It's what you did, but without blood. And I began to explore things about, about it. And it turns out he is the first person to treat malignant hypertension uh, with diet, a very severe sodium restricted diet. But at the time, Smithwick in Boston was doing um, 
um, sympathetic uh, nerve uh, ablations to treat, to try to treat malignant hypertension. And there were no medications yet. This was back to the 30s and 40s when this was being done. And he expanded it to diabetic kidney disease and diabetic eye disease. And, you know, was accused by the, the, um, the powers that be of making up his data because they said you can't treat malignant hypertension. And he got himself into uh, a bit of controversy by presenting his data at a meeting of the, of the New York Academy of Sciences. And uh, the, the moderators of his presentation were the leading powers of kidney disease uh, and hypertension in that day. And um, he said, you know, I showed you pictures of before and after uh, retinal photographs and how we treated them. And you didn't believe me, but doctor, uh, you said I made a misdiagnosis. It could not have been malignant hypertension. But um, doctor, he called on one of the people by name who was the moderator. He said, I have a patient who's here in the room and I didn't make the diagnosis of malignant hypertension. You did. And then he came to see me and we treated him. And here's an ophthalmoscope. Here's the patient. Look in his eyes. They're totally corrected. Take his blood pressure right here and now. What a story. Yeah. Uh, but oh I said, this guy, you know, this attracted me. I said, I want to study this a little bit further. And um, so we, we did get a few people and I tried to, to measure pituitary hormones on them uh, as they went on the rice diet and see whether or not we were doing a bloodless hypothesectomy. By the way, we were not. Um, but, you know, it was trying to understand it. But in the process, I ended up uh, uh, work. What he was basically doing at the time was what was called the rice reduction diet, which was a very low calorie diet of basically rice and fruit. And uh, as, as, a, as a project, I decided to gather together 100 people who'd lost at least 100 pounds. And uh, we ended up with 106 because while I was collecting the data, six more reached the threshold. And we, have, we ended up publishing that in the Archives of Internal Medicine. Uh, and uh, it was a total of seven and a half tons collectively that these 106 people had lost. And it, it, is, it is still the largest weight loss series in the medical literature. We demonstrated that cardiomegaly and um, um, heart failure went away, that triglycerides improved and, and the like. And, um, it was uh, a very interesting experience, but it was a sidelight that moved me into obesity temporarily and away from, uh, from diabetes. But uh, it was, I got into it because of diabetes and continued to focus on diabetes such that as I um, um, was um, an intern, I was approached by Harry Delcher, a young uh, endocrine fellow who said, you know, we're starting this camp for kids with diabetes in North Carolina because they won't let them go to the South Carolina camp or the Tennessee camp anymore. So we're going to do it for North Carolina and South Carolina. And since you're interested in diabetes, you want to come and help me with, with run the place. Well, I started out doing that as an intern. And 15 years later, while I was on the faculty and just being uh, becoming a full professor in, in Miami, I was still going to summer camp every year. And... Uh, and, and really came to believe that the only way you understand type one diabetes is to live with it 24 seven, which is what we did with the kids at camp. And uh, as new developments came along, we, we, actually, um, um, we actually promoted um, those new developments. We put everybody on U100 insulin one summer and we tried to, uh, uh, to put everybody onto uh, combinations of, of regular and, and NPH twice daily when they previously, 78, 80% of them were on a single injection of uh, uh, NPH or Lente. And what we had to do then, once we made that switch was we, we suddenly realized the kids all understood what was going on, but the parents were coming to pick them up. And how were we gonna tell the parents what to do 
when their kid had been on one injection a day and now we're on four components of insulin and we had to instruct their, their home doctors who we had discovered from a previous survey were basically primary care physicians uh, or primary care pediatricians, one or the other in North and South Carolina who had an average of two to three patients in their entire practice with diabetes. Um, we said, did we do the wrong thing by switching him? But we ended up staying up till um, three o'clock in the morning, uh, mimeographing sheets where we filled in the amounts of insulin and told people how you change your insulin doses one at a time, start with the component that controls breakfast, the overnight component, and uh, gradually uh, try to achieve good control by going up and down with the doses. And we ended up eventually publishing them. And that was my first notoriety that I got because uh, the people called them Schuyler algorithms uh, to adjust insulin doses. And um, we then adopted them when we introduced blood glucose monitoring. And, uh, but we started out in 1974, we're just using it on the basis of urine glucose, trying to get the glucose out of the urine. Wow. And, uh, you know, so it, 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 there, there, there have been some interesting things there. I, uh, you know, I had asked Jim Weingard, my chairman of medicine at Duke, whether I could have permission to go to summer camp. Uh, and I sacrificed my vacation for that, uh, half my vacation. And he let me do that. But then I ran into a problem that I was going to, uh, uh, to NIH uh, for two years to escape going to Vietnam. Uh, you know, we were the chicken hearted or the yellow braids in the early seventies. And uh, I had summer camp scheduled for August and I was arriving at NIH on July the 1st. And so in April, when I went up to look for housing, I also made an appointment with my soon to be um, um, NIH research director at the NIH LBI, a guy named Don Fredrickson, who you may have heard of too. Sure. And I said, Dr. Fredrickson, uh, you know, I'm coming here, I'm gonna be in the hypertension endocrine branch in Walt Lovenberg's lab. And uh, I wanted to know if I can get um, two weeks during August to go to diabetes summer camp and do that as part of my assignment as a public health officer. And he looked at me and he said, what do you mean your assignment? I said, well, it's public health to take care of the kids with diabetes at camp. And this is a research institute. And here are two papers we've published on data we collected at camp. So it's a research experience. So it fits with my job description. And I just want to have two weeks to be assigned there to do that. He looked at me, he says, that's the strangest request I've ever gotten, but granted, you can do it. <laughs> So the two years I was at NIH, I continued to go to summer camp and uh, was able to, uh, to, 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 to see many of these things through. But uh, at NIH, I got diverted a little bit because instead of doing diabetes, I worked on growth hormone. Um, I, I did a lot of physical chemistry of growth hormone and I tried to, I, I had worked in the, uh, in the endocrine clinic, and I've had a patient with acromegaly sick, sitting next to a patient who was a growth hormone deficient dwarf. And I said, if I could take his growth hormone and give it to him, I would solve the problem. And so I had this Cephidex column, which was as, just wide and, and as tall as the room where I was isolating growth hormone and trying to purify it so that uh, I could make enough of it to give to uh, uh, to people because at the time they were extracting it from pituitary glands and it was limited. And then there was the crisis that came up of um, uh, Jakob Kreutzfeld. Yeah. So I was trying to solve it another way and that didn't seem to where I wasn't getting enough growth hormone to be able to isolate from, even though I went around to visit newer surgeons at Mayo Clinic and Johns Hopkins to collect their pituitaries to put in here. And I, then we decided a better way to do that was to try to, to uh, to grow them in tissue culture and see if we could purify the growth hormone from the pituits from the acromegalic tumors that was coming there. Problem is when you put an acromegalic tumor in tissue culture, it doesn't make growth hormone, it makes prolactin for the most part. So that didn't go too far either. But uh, 
Yeah, anyway, I did some physical chemistry, growth hormone work. I ended up doing one of those studies in collaboration with C.H. Lee, the wow. person who did the first sequencing of growth hormone from the University of California in San Francisco. And when I go out to San Francisco, he'd take me to the best Chinese restaurants you could find. And he was an art collector of Chinese art. And it turns out that his brother was the curator of the art museum in Taipei. And that's how he got a lot of his art, most spectacular Chinese art collection that you'd ever want to see. Um, and, uh, you know, Tang Dynasty horses and, and all sorts of uh, uh, great things and Ming bowls and um, a delightful man to, 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 to deal with. And we'd go into the Chinese restaurants and uh, he'd never order a thing. They would just bring him whatever they wanted to bring. And it was always spectacular. But Well, that's another thing about you, Jay. You are a real people person. You connect with a lot of people, not just scientists, but uh, folks across the globe. And you've brought people together. You've created organizations as much as you've created data. So among the, the organizations you've created, what, what stands out as things that really gratify you when you look back? You know, I think the thing that gratifies me most is the team I put together to work with um, at the Diabetes Research Institute in, at the University of Miami. Um, my team colleagues there have um, duration of time together with me varying between 15 and 38 years. Wow. And um, they all stay a long time, partly because I, they go through six months of probation. And if I'm not 100% sure that they're gonna be a team member forever, I get rid of them during their probation period because after that you can't. And so you don't wanna make a mistake. But I had a, Fernie Valverde is at the time he was president of Humana Health in South Florida, came by to, uh, to visit me and wanted to meet my team. And I said, you know, well, this is Lisa Rafkin. She runs TrialNet for me. This is Jennifer Mark. She, she's the lead investigator for the clinical trials for me. Uh, this is Jay Sisenko. He writes all the papers for me. This is Alberto Piazza. He runs the lab for me. This is Della Matheson. She's the, the lead trial coordinator. Um, this is uh, Sally Pickell. She's been my administrative coordinator for 30 plus years. Um, and he says, what do you do? <laughs> and I said, I pat him on the back, <laughs> tell them they're doing a great job at the keep it up. And basically I cheerlead. I said, oh, I also get the money for, for grants to do it. But, uh, you know, but, but fundamentally it's having the right people around as a team that makes things work. And, um, when I first came to Miami um, in 1976, um, one of the things I did was have di a, a dietitian and a nurse and a psychologist and a youth counselor work in the clinic. Because to take care of type 1 diabetes, you sort of needed that kind of team together to make it work. And they all had trained at our summer camp. So they had experience of living 24-7 although a couple of them actually had type 1 diabetes themselves. But, um, you know, I, uh, we got known for that uh, early on. And, um, you know, people would send their, their newly hired physician's assistants or, or uh, nurse, nurses to come and spend a week or two in Miami just to see how we do it so they could go back. Julio Santiago, the late Julio Santiago from uh, um, Washington Washington. University in St. Louis, sent um, uh, his, his coordinators to, 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 to learn what we were doing. And uh, it, it was a way to, to really wreck, it was before, we, we started doing that before they, they, or just at the time they were developing the American Association of Diabetes Educators. So it didn't really exist as a profession yet. And I think we, set, we helped um, get that started. Yeah. Well, then there was the diabetes prevention trial and that led to trial net. Yeah, the device prevention trial was something which you had a big hand in, actually. Um, 
uh, Carolyn Siebert, who was the NIH uh, administrator assigned to the diabetes prevention trial, and, and I, uh, I'd put in the, the, the grant for it, and um, they had put out an RFA and said, you know, maximum budget is $500,000 a year. And I looked at that and said, you can't do it for that. And I put in a budget of $5 million a year uh, for a multi-center trial. And it happened to be that at the time we put that in, the DCCT suddenly ended. It, was, it ended early because they had a result. And Congress had appropriated special funds for type 1 diabetes clinical trials to do the DCCT. And they, could, they were earmarked to just do that. And so now that the DCCT was ending, even though they were in a continuum at a lower level in edict, they had more money around that they had to do on type 1 diabetes trials. And we put in this grant, and, and it had gotten approved by the study section. They just didn't have the funding. All of a sudden, we were called in. And we had our grant and we set that up, but we came to your office because we wanted to study oral insulin. At FDA. You're, you were at the FDA at the time, yes. And we came in to, to talk about, you know, can we, can we do that? And uh, it was a special preparation. It was, we were having made at a, a compounding pharmacy, although Lily gave us the crystals to do it with. Um, but uh, so we wanted to know whether that could be a, a product we could test in a clinical trial. And you, you looked at me and you said, well, I don't have to worry about it creating hypoglycemia because if it lowered glucose, somebody would be selling it. <laughs> and, but you do have to worry about potential GI side effects. And you, you, you asked us to do a, a relatively minimal number of patients where we would put them on the drug for a few weeks and see whether or not there were any GI side effects before we could proceed. And uh, we did that. And then you gave us the green light. And uh, we move forward. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Um, there were some tantalizing results. There were some tantalizing. You know, we we the, 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 we we actually did two studies. We did in, in DPT one. We did injected insulin in those who we pr projected would have a fifty percent chance of developing type one diabetes in the next five years. These are all relatives of people with type one diabetes who are antibody positive, and. If you, if you characterize them enough, you could project a either greater than 50% or 25 to 50% potential time. And we did the injected insulin in greater than 50%, the oral insulin in 25 to 50%. But the injected insulin protocol was based on, we studied 379 patients, I think it was, um, that we randomized. And, um, it was based on an 11 patient study in the Lancet that suggested in a pilot study that the intervention might work. And we went ahead with spending $5 million a year of the government's money, 379 people. And what we demonstrated was we accurately predicted who would develop type one diabetes in the next five years, but the intervention didn't work. And one of the lessons there is that you can't base any conclusions on small pilot studies. But we at least did a full-blown trial to, uh, to demonstrate that it worked. And one of the interesting things we had was the number of people, endocrinologists around the country, who said, well, you found my, my patient has a 50% risk in five years. I'm going to just go ahead and treat them with insulin like they found in Lancet because it's going to work. And why put them in your study where they might be randomized to not get the insulin. People put too much faith in pilot studies. Yeah. And uh, so, and then we did 332 more people in the, uh, in the oral insulin study. And unfortunately, uh, placebo and insulin were superimposable in the group as a whole. We did find a subgroup that was tantalizingly beneficial. Um, and uh, unfortunately, they were the people who had the original enrollment criteria. We modified the enrollment criteria because enrollment was going slowly and let more people in than we should have. 
And had we stuck with the original enrollment criteria, that subgroup had a four year delay in the development of type one diabetes. But um, wow. it was a post hoc retrospective analysis. And so you, you learn not to change protocols in the middle of your study to try to increase enrollment, just cast your net larger. But so a lot of lessons there. And then when we finished that, we morphed into trial net. And uh, I was again asked to take over and, and lead that. And, uh, you know, we, we, we conducted about 18 different studies during my tenure. Um, uh, between DPT-1 and trial net, I was there for 22 years and um, stepped down in 2015. Um, to, uh, That's still going. It's still going. It, you know, we had a, a second chairman, Carla Greenbaum, from 2015 till recently, and Kevin Harold from Yale just became the new chairman. Uh, and they're starting to put together a whole bunch of new studies that that you know hopefully can get done. And uh, you know, I've learned a number of lessons from from that. One of the things I've learned is we we tried so hard to do things where you could do a short-term intervention and hope for a long-term effect. And it worked for some things. Um, you could get a long-term effect from either six days or 14 days of an anti-CD3 monoclonal antibody, or for two days of low-dose anti-thymocyte globulin. But on almost everything else, if you stop the drug, they, they, the, the treatment group ends up, you know, behaving like the placebo group for the, for the rest of the time. And, and um, that has been a, a major dilemma that your former colleagues at the FDA have insisted be done, that you stop the thing and see if there's a persistent effect. And I think the lesson that I've learned from that is that, you know, there was a, a study last year, the, the, uh, the TIGER study, with golimumab, an anti-TNF alpha. And during the course of the year that they gave the drug, there was absolutely no decline in beta cell function in the TNF group. And as soon as they stop it, it goes down, you know, abruptly. And anti-TNF has, has been given to rheumatoid arthritis patients or psoriasis patients for years on end. There's no reason to suspect that you need to stop it and that the effect might continue because there's no evidence that that happens. And I, that happened, that's happened too often with a number of the studies of late. And so, you know, there, I try to accumulate my thoughts on what are the lessons I have learned as a clinical trialist uh, from, from leading these networks. And, you know, one is uh, uh, don't trust pilots. Another is don't change protocols midstream. Another is, you know, don't abruptly stop drugs if there's no reason to suspect that their effect should be indefinite. You know, it's a lot of interesting things. Well, over your very impressive career, you've seen a lot of good, bad, and ugly. What stand out as the major advances in diabetes, uh, type one and or type two? Um, I think the, the single most important advance that we've had is the development of continuous glucose monitoring. And um, how about going back to DCCT? Oh, DCCT showed the importance of glucose control. And that clearly was, you know, uh, you know, it's what I believed all along. So it, <laughs> it vindicated things, uh, you know, and um, yeah, we mentioned Julio Santiago before. Julio Santiago, David Shade, Bob Risen. I had written a book in, um, uh, in 1983, and um, we started in 80, writing it in 82 on intensive uh, insulin therapy and how to achieve it. And that really became the method section for the DCCT. And the reason... Um, I did not become a DCCT center site was because I already believed that glucose control A was achievable and B was important, but I was on the policy advisory group for the, for the, for the DCCT, but the, the other authors all 
went ahead and became centers as well. Uh, the DCCT was a remarkable study, and now in its 35th or whatever year, um, is, um, is, is truly an amazing, um, an amazing accomplishment in the field that really changed everything. Um, I thought you were talking about um, new advances from the standpoint of, of uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, devices when you asked the question. So I- No, no, that's, uh, those are fair game too. But, yeah. Uh, but, I, so, but the DCCT clearly is the most important study that's ever been done in diabetes, no question. Um, and, but before you come back to glucose monitoring, um, you've been involved with virtually every class of therapeutic development in diabetes. So what stands out to you there? Uh, I mean, we've got insulin analogs and more recently the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. So uh, you've seen a lot of advances. Of what, what stand out to you is uh, very important. I think the development of recombinant DNA technology to allow insulin production and then insulin analogs is a one of the major scientific accomplishments of the last century. Um, and your former boss uh, at FDA, Saul Sobel, really was the guy who facilitated that because there had been a National Academy of Sciences uh, report suggesting that recombinant DNA technology should not be used because we might be making bacteria that were dangerous. And, um, you know, the, the folks who, who came to the FDA from Lilly with recombinant DNA technology for insulin, you know, we're going against that National Academy of Sciences thesis. And Saul Sobel, who was the chief at the time, recognized the importance of doing that because I don't think that the world today appreciates that every batch of insulin made had to be biologically tested. With rabbits. <laughs> with rabbits in the old days. You, you had to show their hypoglycemic effect. You couldn't, you, you know, your, your colleagues at the FDA asked me to chair a, a, a session at a meeting on hormone drugs where I got together the people from all the insulin companies and we, we could agree that you could use HPLC to characterize insulin instead of having to do the biological tests. Sure. But, um, but Saul Sobel recognized that we're gonna run out of animals as the diabetes need for insulin continues. And we're not gonna be able to continue to extract insulin and, and then have to not only purify, but test each batch and that recombinant DNA technology was a viable answer. But he, he said, I don't know anything about it, the science. So he went out and he hired experts in recombinant DNA technology to join the division or to be oh. consultants to the division. And, you know, and they followed things every step of the way. It was sort of a, a, a moving target NDA where pieces were submitted as, as things moved along. And it got approved very rapidly after the final submission because the FDA was prepared and was open-minded and interested in seeing advances. Yeah. Something, something which doesn't always occur at the FDA today. Yeah. Sorry to have to say that, but. Well, um, that's true. And of course, growth hormone followed shortly thereafter, just in time for the Jacob Kreutzfeldt syndrome. Problem. Yes, and, and had it not been for that, we would have many people with growth hormone deficiency who could never have been treated. Um, so, you know, you, uh, you had a, a very advanced division and uh, advanced in later years too. When I first wanted to do uh, immune intervention, I'd gotten the first grant from um, NIH to, uh, to study immune intervention in human beings. And we came to, again, your, your group at FDA and Sal Sobel was there and um, I wanted to study cyclosporin in new onset diabetes. And uh, we presented all the information. We had actually uh, John Francois Bach and Jacques Burrell from um, the John Francois Bach from France who studied 
uh, cyclosporin and Jacques Burrell, who had invented it, and Phil Felig, who at the time was president of Sandoz USA, who were making the stuff for transplant purposes. And we all met and went over all the data and things. And uh, Saul Sobel said, yeah, you made a good case. I said, does that mean I can enroll patients? He said, yes. And somebody in the back of the room raised his hand, went to NFDA for this, but I still have a few questions. And Saul turned and looked at him and said, no, you don't. <laughs> and we were able to start those studies. And, uh, you know, it was a very, it was a very friendly place to work with. And uh, um, I, I think the FDA contributed a lot to, uh, to allowing me to get, get a, a number of things done in my career. And so uh, I'm very appreciative to, uh, to, to you all folks and uh, who, who did that. But uh, how well, did we fast develop? forwarding uh, to oh. back to CGM, right? Uh, say a few words about that. Well, you know, um, I was involved with uh, with insulin pumps uh, in the nineteen eighties, um, and this guy Al Mann came to see me, hey. and he 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 wanted to know whether I would be willing to work with him and and chair his advisory board for his new company, which was called Minimed. And so I did, and I joined the advisory board, and then I was on the board of directors. And then along the way, we developed a uh, continuous glucose monitor. Didn't work very well in retrospect. Uh, you could only use it for a couple of days, but you know it was. Uh, it was, it was a, the beginning of a way of changing the way we think about monitoring diabetes. And uh, um, we, we, he also had an implantable glucose sensor that he put into the vena cava and used that together with an implantable insulin pump in the peritoneal cavity. So everything was implantable. And when those experiments were first coming out, Minimed was approached by Medtronic saying, you know, we'd like to buy the company, but we also need to buy Man Research Group because these products were being developed not in the company, so it didn't affect the bottom line, but in a separate group. And they bought both. And I was convinced they bought both in order to take um, the uh, implantable system to, to fully develop it and get it to market. Instead, they killed it and just kept the external pump and then have struggled to try to develop a, uh, a glucose sensor since then. They haven't done as well as some others. But um, I had been on the board of directors of, of Minimed toward the end of that. And uh, when Minimed was bought by Medtronic, I didn't have a job of that anymore. Uh, I had a lot of other jobs, but... And so I was approached by Dexcom to, uh, would I be willing to join their board of directors? And uh, I did in 2002 and have remained on there ever since and, uh, and have tried to shepherd uh, the, uh, the group to, to do things the right kind of way and uh, which they have. And we've had great leadership uh, at Dexcom and Terry Gregg and then Kevin Sayre um, and um, great technology and people who are really committed and uh, continuous glucose monitoring now really does work. And I think it's been the most important advance we've had. It's, it's, a lot, it's facilitated automated insulin delivery, which still has a little ways to go before it's perfected, but it's really, you can get perfect overnight control and avoid hypoglycemia with it, with automated insulin delivery now, if you have the right glucose sensor. Um, and uh, so I think that's the, you know, what the, the, the biggest uh, advance in diabetes in type one. Um, in type two, I think GLP ones are the, uh, the, major, um, the major thing that has occurred because um, you, you really can now with, with once a week, um, control your glucose well, achieve your targets, lose weight and help control the type two diabetes. And it has beneficial effects in terms of the cardiovascular risk. Uh, that's huge. And, uh, you know, I, I think that is, if I had to pick three biggest advances, one is recombinant DNA technology to make insulin, insulin analogs, two is continuous glucose monitoring, and three is GLP-1 re receptor uh, agonists. 
Good. Well, what what do you see in the near term and the more distant future for diabetes research and clinical care? What what do you see as prospects for actually preventing uh, type one and type two and uh, chronic diseases of other kind? That is a, um, I can tell you what I foresee as, as the kinds of research directions, whether they will work or not is another issue. Let's focus first on type one and then I'll turn to type two. But um, in type one, um, there are clinical trials underway, both with human embryonic stem cells that can secrete insulin and with induced pluripotent stem cells that can secrete insulin. Um, they're very early along. Um, and, you know, they're, I think that, you know, we need to see uh, how we can overcome the hurdles of accomplishing those trials before one knows whether or not we'll be successful. I hope we will be. And, um, you know, I think it will take you know, having not only the source of cells, but having an environment that the cells don't undergo immune attack. Immune attack either from the rejection standpoint or from the recurrent autoimmune standpoint. And, um, you know, so that means we need to, to either use immunosuppressive or immunomodulator drugs or appropriately encapsulate the cells or the islets, but still allow there to be reasonable oxygen flow in and nutrient flow in and insulin flow out. And uh, that's not necessarily an easy accomplishment. We have to have a, a suitable place that we can implant the cells. And that is to create some dilemmas of its own because islet transplants are put into the liver, but that's not really, that's really more of, of a hostile environment than we'd like it to be. You can put them in the omentum, um, but one of the, the dangers that people fear with uh, either induced pluripotent stem cells or human embryonic stem cells is that they might differentiate to something else after they've been implanted. And that's particularly worrisome with human embryonic stem cells, even though I think they've now been differentiated enough before they put in that the teratoma concern that had existed is probably no longer the case, at least with the viocyte cells that are the ones in clinical trials. Um, but because of that concern and the concern of your former agency, they, they're put in subcutaneously in the flank or in the abdomen or in the back so that you can run an ultrasound over them and make sure there's no excessive growth occurring. And so that's a, a, as a safety indication, but I, that's not really a great place to get good beta cell function from these cells in a high enough uh, concentration of beta cells and, and mass of beta cells to reverse diabetes completely. So it has created, that the, the site creates some problems. Uh, Vertex is using induced pluripotent stem cells are using them into the liver, just like islets were. Uh, and you know, with the argument that they're already differentiated and so therefore they will not differentiate into something else. But again, as I said, that's a hostile environment, not necessarily the best place to test them. So, you know, and then ideally we wanna get rid of the immune response too. And you can do that with CRISPR to either create um, immune evasion where you get rid of the HLA signals on the uh, to be implanted cells and or immune protection where you stimulate uh, protective immune markers so that, that they will survive better in uh, after after implantation and so you know that that those are a lot of things to be asked for um, and as the the research goes on you discover more things um, I, uh, I recall the last time we had a live ADA meeting was in 2019 in San Francisco. And the University of California, San Francisco 
had a reception for their friends um, in the top floor at a Salesforce building, which is the biggest building in San Francisco, the, the best views anywhere. And Matthias Hebrock from UCSF had that earlier that day chaired a session on human embryonic stem cells. And I saw Matthias at the reception. I said, Matthias, you spent the last 20 years of your life studying induced pluripotent stem cells. And here I see you chairing a session enthusiastically about human embryonic stem cells. What gives? He, said, he says, you know, to, get, to get induced pluripotent stem cells, you first have to get cells, and then you have to de-differentiate them so they go back to being pluripotent, and then you have to induce them to becoming insulin-secreting beta cells. So there are several steps that you need to go through. And every time you do it in the lab, it's not necessarily reproducible, and you don't necessarily get the same thing. And I said, geez, I understand that. I understand it from the CGM standpoint, because one of the things that has occurred is a lot of people will, will come around, they'll show you they got a great continuous glucose monitor they do on the bench uh, top in their little lab, and it looks like it works. But you have to scale that to be commercially viable, and you have to have it reproducible. And that's why even some very large companies who I won't mention, who are well-known multi-billion dollar companies in the pharmaceutical field, when they've tried to get into that, they found they could do it on the ben bench top and they said, oh, we're gonna rival Dexcom. And then they gave up the project because they couldn't do it on a large scale. It is a very complicated thing to scale things up. And what Matthias was saying is that if you, you do one experiment, that you can do that experiment. Then you try to do it again and again. It's not necessarily that you get the same cells and the same reproducibility. And so I think that although Vertex has a reasonable source of cells at the moment, and Viacite has billions of cells that they can make from the same embryo that they've been using all along, it's still, you know, there, 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 there are umpteen challenges that you discover along the way from trying to protect them from immunity to where to put them to how to get enough of the cells that um, I hope that in my lifetime, I see this mature into a way that we can reverse diabetes with, uh, um, with, with beta cells of one kind and that we have an unlimited supply, but um, I'm not sure how long that will take. And I really get perturbed when people say, well, we're five years away. We'll have the cure in five years. You know, that's what they said in the 1970s when uh, islet transplantation and the first artificial pancreas appeared. You may recall that um, a 1974 paper from uh, Albizir and Libel with an artificial pancreas. It made perfect control of glucose, provided you had an, two intravenous lines in, one for infusion and one for exfusion, and you had a big a big thing sitting by your bedside. And, you know, other groups were doing it at the same time. Um, um, Pfeiffer and Clemens in Germany, uh, Moreau's in France, um, uh, Shashiri in Japan. Everybody had those big machines that worked, but they were big machines. And, um, you know, it's taken us a long time to get to automated insulin delivery, and we're still imperfect about controlling meals. So, I, I never try to put a time frame on something. Um, I think that's dangerous, but I, I hope in my lifetime I will see beta cell replacement uh, advance. You asked about prevention. I've been working in that space for immune intervention for prevention for 35 years or more, um, 1984, that's 37 years, I guess. Um, you know, I have great hopes that we'll get there, but as we keep going on, I learn more and more about how type one diabetes evolves and it ain't so simple. And so I think we'll get there because there's a lot of good people with a lot of good brains working on things. But uh, uh, again, I'm not putting a time frame on it, but I, but I hope we'll get there. 
And so those are the, the three things that I think that we, I look forward to in type one diabetes, more perfect automated insulin delivery, beta cell replacement, um, immune intervention, and going along with beta cell replacement is perhaps beta cell regeneration as well, that we may be able to awaken the sleeping beta cells and get them to, to, to reproduce. But, you know, so those are the things I look forward to there. Um, type two. Type two and obesity, almost, you know, they're, they're joined at, at the hip. Um, you know, that, that there are so much that overlaps with, uh, with type two diabetes and with obesity. And, you know, what I don't understand is how we've allowed as a society for the obesity epidemic to unfold so so phenomenally and you know in in the 19 late 1970s Paul Zimmett called it the coke colonization of the south pacific because everybody there was getting big and huge like we did in in our part of the world and uh, you know, when McDonald's first started in the early 1950s, they served this little itty bitty hamburger with a little itty bitty bag of fries and maybe a, a, an eight ounce uh, soft drink. People ate that and, and were full. Why is it that now they can eat a double Whopper or whatever they call it. Uh, I may be getting my chains mixed up, uh, uh, but or Big Mac, whatever, whatever they, they call these things, plus a huge bag of fries and a drink that is sky high, and they're not satiated. What's changed in the way we perceive and deal with food? And I think that is a fundamental question that we do not understand and that we need to. Um, you know, I go to the gym three mornings a week. Um, my trainer can be a killer some mornings because <laughs> I don't really want to get up after I've had a late night, but I'm there anyway because he, he comes at six. And so I got to be there at 545 for my 15 minute warm up before he gets there. And, uh, you know, I look at so many people who don't do any exercise at all. If you're not physically active and if you're not satiated by what you eat, how do you stop this obesity epidemic? I, you know, I find it to be very frustrating. I'm so glad that we have really potent GLP-1 receptor uh, agonists and, um, combined GLP-1 drugs with, with, with other, um, either GLP or, or glucagon or, 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 or other things to, that, that may be double, triple hormone uh, modulators. But how did we get here in the first place? I think that we need a better understanding of that. And it, it, it affects atherosclerosis, it affects cancer risk, it affects so many things. And, uh, you know, if we want to have a population that really does have the opportunity to age, my grandparents always says you got to live to 120. Um, you know, they made it into their 90s. So, uh, you know, I'm glad that, that they did that in, in previous generations. But, but I, uh, you know, the biblical 120, you know, and getting us all there, I think is, is tougher uh, all along, we need to be paying more attention to the processes of aging and to the processes that lead to obesity and, and sedentary lifestyle if we're going to ever conquer these things. And, you know, I, I am appalled, quite frankly, at the current generation of advertisements on television and in magazines because all of a sudden they are glorifying obesity. I think that we once, I remember we once glorified cigarette smoking 
on TV and in the media. And we ended up with a lot of people dying of lung cancer and other problems because of that. Why are we glorifying obesity now? And, you know, I saw an ad for a major Paris designer just yesterday in a fashion magazine. It's the um, New York Times Tea Magazine, which is their fashion thing that comes out uh, every periodically. And I looked at that and the people in the ad where there was one normal sized person, everybody else was either fatter and fatter and fatter than the other trying to show off these clothes. And I'm figuring, why are they glorifying this? That shouldn't be what we're glorifying. Um, you know, and I appreciate that in the Me Too movement, people got upset with uh, Victoria's Secret glorifying thin young models, but you don't go flip it the other way around and glorify obesity. I think that's fundamentally wrong. And we're, you know, we're, we're, we're letting people feel accepted by obesity. And, uh, you know, we got to really be dealing with that too. Well, Jay, as you know, we're taking it on in a fundamental roots up way at the Metabesity Conference. You're returning for the third time to chair two sessions and the four day meeting that begins this year, October 11th. And um, you're going to be chairing a panel that's going to take on the deep roots of metabolic disease and how uh, these uh, chronic diseases share the same metabolic drivers. And I uh, really look forward to that. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, we talk about the metabolic drivers. I still worry about the psychological drivers as well, sure. and, and particularly the way society has changed the script. Um, and, um, you know, I think that we need to find a way to deal with that as well. It's not just the science and the metabolic markers and the metabolic interventions that we need to have. We need to change the way people think about the problem. That's right. And, and the that's, conference that's is one of your focuses. Yeah. That's right. The session on behavior is or actually two sessions will take on what we can do to actually uh, modify behavior and convert the uh, folks into your kind of lifestyle of exercise and, and careful diet. Yeah, so we'll I, hope, forward to that. I hope we can get there. I, you know, I have a uh, a number of friends who I just shake my head at when they, you know, with their with their behaviors and and their body size, and it 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 can be scary. Yeah. Well, Jay, what a great pleasure to learn some new things I didn't know about you. I thought I was uh, I was fairly uh, informed about your life history, but you taught me that you had bariatric retinopathy. Um, um, neuroendocrine experience and ultimately all that uh, led to your becoming a, a preeminent diabetologist and one who's made a huge difference in a number of ways. Well, you know, I think one of the things that's critical for young people going into science to realize is that there's a whole hell of a lot of questions out there that need to be answered. And if you design things carefully so that you can get a clear answer, I'm a clinical trialist, so it's designing randomized clinical trials that can demonstrate a finding one way or the other. But whether you're a laboratory scientist or whatever it is, there's so many things to be out there. And if you do careful experiments and you work hard, you can also have a hell of a lot of fun doing it. And uh, you know, I, I think that's important and to respect all the members on your team um, and let them all share in, 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 in the fruits of the efforts and, and the rewards. Well, you have modeled that behavior in spades. And uh, I know there'll be so many people who have enjoyed watching and listening to your, your uh, career story. We thank you very much for, for taking the time. And I thank you, Zan. You've been a good friend for 
you know, many, many, many years. And uh, I, uh, I enjoy always our interaction. So thank you. <laughs>